the Fall 2020 Hinkle, Pryor, and Fisher Parent Empowerment Conference, Realities for a New Reality. Two days, 25 workshops, renowned speakers and presenters, by families, for families, nearly 40 hours of unfiltered and straightforward information made possible by the leaders in disability rights advocacy for over 45 years, Hinkle, Pryor, and Fisher, Attorneys at Law. So welcome to this session of our ongoing Encore presentation series of the Fall 2020 Hinkle, Pryor, and Fisher Parent Empowerment Conference. All right, let's get started. So, um, you know, welcome and thank you everyone for attending the Hinkle, Pryor, and Fisher Virtual Parent Empowerment Conference. My name is Jared Oberweiss, and I will be your moderator for today's workshop, which is titled uh, Surrogate Decision-Making Options in Guardianship. Our presenter for this session is Ellen Nalvin. Uh, before we, we begin, I just want to you know, reiterate that all participants are currently muted, and we would ask that you remain muted throughout the presentation. This workshop will last for about one hour, and if time allows, the presenter will take questions at the end. Please ask your questions um, through the chat feature in the control bar, and I will ask as many of them as I can. Again, you know, time permitting. Um, also, if you have not already done so, I highly encourage you to sign up uh, for this evening's keynote address, which is going to be delivered by uh, former New Jersey Supreme Court Justice Helen E. Hones, entitled Autism After COVID-19, Navigating a World Where Everything Changed and Nothing Changed. Justice Hones is also the parent of an adult child with autism, and will provide a unique perspective on the times in which we live. She's both an inspiring person and an inspirational public speaker. You won't want to miss out. Simply go to the conference event page, click on the agenda tab, scroll down to the keynote and sign up. It is now my pleasure to welcome our presenter. Ellen Nalvin is the executive director of Planned Lifetime Assistance Network of New Jersey, also known as Plan New Jersey. Ellen Nalvin educates families on the quality, I'm sorry, on the importance of life planning to promote independent living and quality of life for individuals with disabilities. In this role, she serves as legal guardian and trustee for special needs trusts and oversees the delivery of case management, advocacy, and life planning services for over 600 people. Previously, she served on the faculty of the Department of Psychiatric Rehabilitation at the University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey as Director of Employment Services for Our House, Inc., and as a Program Consultant for the New Jersey Division of Developmental Disabilities. Ellen earned a Master's Degree in Education and a Postmaster's Certificate in Psychiatric Rehabilitation. She holds dual teaching degrees and is certified to teach individuals with disabilities and people who are deaf and hard of hearing. Ellen has received national recognition for her work in employment for people with disabilities. In 2012, she received the National Rebecca McDonald Leadership Award from APPS, the Association for People Supporting Employment First. And in 2009, she was awarded the Co-Founder Award from New Jersey APPS. Ellen is also a member of the Board of Directors of the National Plan Alliance. It is my pleasure to now turn it over to Ellen. Hi, everyone. Thank you for attending this session this morning. And uh, Jared, I'm gonna turn over the waiting room to you. I've let a few people in. So um, without further ado, we're gonna get started. Um, as Jared mentioned, we will ask you to put your questions in the chat box and we will address them at the end of the session. And we'll also open it up for verbal questions at that time. So um, our session today is um, guardianship and surrogate decision-making. And we're gonna be talking specifically about um, self-determination under guardianship. We'll be talking about best practices and techniques for promoting self-determination. And um, uh, the difference, what it will be defining surrogate decision-making because there are some specific uh, definitions that we need to understand. So in terms of our agenda, we're going to talk very briefly about different forms of guardianship and very briefly about alternatives to guardianship. If you wanna know more about alternatives, please attend our uh, host Jared Oberweiss's session at 3.30 today. 
Um, but we will definitely be talking about that briefly. Um, we're going to define surrogate decision making, as I mentioned. So it is cons there are two forms of judgment that a guardian has to consider. One is called substitute judgment, where the guardian is making a decision that is what the person under guardianship would do um, and uh, as to the best of the guardian's knowledge. And the other is a best interest decision, which is uh, what a reasonable person would do if, the, if we don't know what the person under guardianship would do um, or if we're not comfortable with their decision. Uh, we're going to be identifying methods of promoting self-determination. Uh, we'll talk about informed consent. How do we help a person, especially someone with a, a significant intellectual or developmental disability, how do we help them participate in the decision-making process? Um, so methods of, and techniques of, of supported decision-making. We're also going to talk about the role of a life plan. Um, the, a life plan is such an important aspect and part of guardianship and supporting and advocating for a person. Number one, the plan promotes choice and control. And also, and this is kind of the theme for our session today, um, it's so important to have a plan so that you can communicate to successor guardians your sense of what a person, the rights and um, abilities and decision-making capacity of the person. So very often in these sessions, these are family members, parents who are attending, and this may be your situation. So you may know what you want for your child and what your child is capable of doing, um, but your successor guardians may not. So we'll be talking about that. So let me tell you a few, a little bit about Plan New Jersey. We were established uh, 32 years ago, um, by actually by the Ark of New Jersey. Welcome, Tom Bafudo. I understand you're in the session. Um, the and uh, the the Ark of New Jersey did establish Plan New Jersey, and then we were spun off by design uh, to serve in these capacities that I'm about to share with you. So we do serve statewide, um, and our mission is to help families answer the question. Who will care for my loved one when I'm gone? Which is obviously a very large, challenging, and um, difficult question to answer. There are many, many questions within that question, of course. So um, in terms of Plan New Jersey's services, um, critically, we serve as backup for key roles. And also, we serve as sibling support. So sometimes people say, well, but they have, they have residential services and they have a support coordinator and they've got maybe a support broker and they've got great support in their, um, you know, with their residential services and that's always wonderful. Um, but sometimes the siblings who may be in charge of taking over in a critical role need support themselves. And then also we are backup for some of these key roles when there are no other people to serve, for example, as trustee of special needs trusts. We do that for well over 500 people who are active trusts. And then we've got well over 200 families who have identified Plan New Jersey as future or successor trustee. And sometimes we're just backup. So the sibling is intended to be the trustee, but we are the backup in case the sibling at that time doesn't want to serve as trustee or cannot serve. And the same thing goes for guardian. We often are backup. If there are no siblings, then we are backup to the parents. We serve as successor guardian for 37 individuals. Um, and, um, but we also have um, well over, again, close to 300 families who want us to serve as guardian should some, their, their siblings not be available um, or the intended successor guardian. And then we have representative payee services for um, over 40 people. Life planning, as I started to mention, we do in a big way. And a lot of times that is not just getting down communicating to families what uh, what they want and what the individual you know what the individual wants to communicate to their advocates and caregivers um, but it's also we serve in a consulting role to help families to determine 
what type of guardianship or what type of alternative to guardianship, what type of legal protections might be most appropriate um, or beneficial to the individual. And then we do a service called home visit monitoring and advocacy where we are the proactive eyes on the person. We're visiting people at least once a month, sometimes more often. And so our service coordinators, not to be confused with support coordinators, it's a different role. We serve as an advocate and we visit individuals in their homes. Um, as I said, monthly, sometimes more. We are ser coordinating services, so we may coordinate with support coordinator and with family and helping to make sure that the, the um, individual support plan is being followed and the, the services the person wants are in place. Um, so advocacy is a big part of what we do. Advocacy with public benefits and um, agencies, Social Security, Medicaid, developmental disabilities, and we also um, serve in the mental health system. We serve people with mental illness, people with physical disabilities, people with traumatic brain injury. We kind of serve everyone that needs our services in any of these roles. So I'm going to start just with a, some quick definitions of legal guardianship. Um, when a person turns 18, as you probably know, parents no longer have the legal right to make decisions or gain information about the individual. So uh, on occasion, people have a problem with the schools, where the schools, the person turns 18, they have no legal guardian, and um, they may need to, um, uh, sorry, I'm just admitting people, that's my hesitation here. Um, Jared, we have a couple people in the waiting room, I think. Um, so um, at age 18, a person is responsible to make decisions for themselves. Um, medical decisions, housing decisions, legal, financial, and educational decisions. And so we want to um, be aware that if we are concerned that um, someone might be um, in danger or vulnerable, um, potentially, um, you know, could be uh, vulnerable to exploitation, uh, guardianship uh, should be considered at this point in time. So one of the things that's most important for people to know is that there are different forms of guardianship. And um, so, yes, a person, the court is appointing a person. They are determining that a person is, ha, um, is incapacitated and they are appointing a person to act on behalf of the individual. But something that is um, much more frequently used at this point is limited guardianship. And so this is a place where, um, this is a type of guardianship where a person's uh, rights and, and responsibilities can be retained legally. And this is included in the, um, uh, in the judgment where either the rights that they're going to retain are um, included or, um, or the, the rights that are the guardian is going to be responsible for are included. So it can be what's left out or what's included. Um, but this is very important to know. So we do find that some families are very concerned naturally about um, taking away individuals' rights. And so um, awareness of limited guardianship can be um, a, a, a good alternative for, for families to know, well, you know, financially they're incredibly vulnerable and can't make decisions for themselves or someone would uh, try to um, take advantage of them. But in terms of housing decisions, they really can make decisions and we want them to make decisions for themselves. Um, I'll give you one, and then the, the other um, form of guardianship is guardian of the person or guardian of the property or both property or estate. So in this case, guardian of the person really has full responsibility for making all medical, housing, education, legal and financial, uh, legal, rather guardian of the, of the property or estate controls the legal and financial decisions, con contracts and that kind of thing. So um, I'll give you one example of limited guardianship. We um, serve a, per, a, a person who has severe mental illness, who was um, 
in Trenton Psychiatric for a very, very, very long time, many years. And his um, father died. And so Trenton Psychiatric was aware that he had a guardian and needed a, another guardian. So we were appointed, um, we were approached by his, um, by an attorney to consider and we did accept. And um, in this case, he was given a limited guardianship and this man had very, has very significant mental illness. Um, but the court wanted to have him retain his ability to maintain his finances in terms of managing his representative payee funds. He lives in a supervised apartment and has the ability with staff support to pay his rent, pay his bills. And so he was, um, the, the court uh, recommended that he retain his right to pay his own bills um, and serve as his own representative payee. Um, so um, limited guardianship is a tool that can be very helpful and beneficial. So um, as I mentioned, um, alternatives to guardianship, we'll talk very briefly about these. And if at 3.30, Jared Oberweiss, our host, will be talking in more depth about this if you'd like more information. Powers of, of attorney and healthcare proxy are ways of, um, without involving the court, allowing a person to have someone to stand in their stead. Um, we all should have them. If you don't have a power of attorney and healthcare proxy, I urge you to get one. Um, these, this enables someone and authorizes someone to serve um, and, and make decisions uh, power of attorney or legal and, and financial decisions and healthcare proxy are healthcare decisions. You can sign somebody into a rehab center. Um, uh, if there is, a, sorry, I forgot to turn off my own phone. Um, so, um, uh, but the issue with a power of attorney is that um, the person, this is revocable. So the person can tear this document up if they choose to. So one of the things I do urge, if you feel like a person with a disability does have the capacity to, to have a power of attorney, sign a power of attorney document to allow a parent or a sibling or a friend to serve in this role, I do suggest that you have uh, an attorney draw up this document because um, the, the attorney is also participating in the assessment and, and kind of affirming that the person does have the capacity to make this decision. And I think this that um, can help in case a doctor or hospital or other organization doesn't feel in meeting the person that they do have capacity to sign this document. So you do have to remember though, it's revocable, they can tear it up. Representative payee for social security benefits is not legal, not involved by the court. Um, not determined by the court in that other example I gave you, really that the court can only recommend that the person be their own representative payee. It's really social security that makes this determination that they need it. But a family can make a case that the person, um, if they only have um, funds, social security funds, then the, the uh, court, the person, the, the family member can make a case that the person does need their social security funds managed by a payee, but um, uh, they may not have any other funds. If they do have funds, uh, the funds can be placed in a, tr in a special needs trust, and then the trustee is responsible, is the fiduciary and is responsible for ensuring that um, the trust um, that the funds that were left in, in an inheritance or by a, um, uh, uh, in an accident um, are managed properly and appropriately. And this is also a means of, men, of uh, maintaining a person's public benefits, means-tested benefits. So um, please do call our office if you have more questions about special needs trusts. We have lots of information to share if you would like. Conservator is not used very often in New Jersey, but it is a good tool because a conservator is a way of managing primarily financial decisions that is in essence blessed by a court, but it is voluntary. And so um, the person, as long as the, the court has to be convinced that the person 
has capacity to make this decision to appoint someone as conservator, a conservator, but it does mean that a bank really cannot even question because the, the conservator's role to manage a person's finances or a creditor, um, there is no there's no question about that because there is a court order appointing the conservator. Um, it does have to be revoked in a court of, of law, but there isn't a determinant of incapacity um, in this process. So that's a nice tool that, that people can consider. So let's talk about the duties and responsibilities of a guardian, because this is where the surrogate decision-making really comes in. So um, you do have to remember that um, Guardianship is an involuntary situation. A guardianship does, um, is imposed on the person through the courts. And this is why families may have some hesitation about uh, removal of a person's rights. Um, certainly this is a very, very serious consideration because rights really mean choice. They mean autonomy. They mean freedom of movement. And so we have to carefully consider whether perhaps a limited guardian would be sufficient and we can protect the person um, from the things that we're concerned about that might harm them without um, taking away certain rights. Um, certainly in New Jersey, a person's rights to voting and, and um, marriage are not removed by the court, but, um, but all the other rights, um, personal rights, financial rights, decision-making on medical treatment, um, all of those things are uh, potentially taken away from the person, but sometimes this is the right move to make. Very, it, guardianship is a balancing act between pr promoting autonomy and independence and protecting a person from harm. So a person, um, the guardian is by law strongly encouraged. It's not mandated. I checked the law. It's not mandated self-determination, but it is strongly encouraged. And so the guardian is responsible to promote self-determination of the person under guardianship. Um, and also the guardian is, must um, help a person to pursue revocation, to remove, to revoke the guardianship if the person uh, feels that they should no longer um, retain guardianship. Um, they should no longer be under a guardian. So um, I'll give you an example of where protecting from harm, and I'm, I'm sure you can think of many examples yourselves, but we have another woman, uh, another man. I, I will say that the majority of the folks that we serve as guardian for are people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, but it happens in these two examples. Um, uh, I'm, we are responsible for these folks, another person who has severe mental illness, and this is a man who literally lived at Trenton Psychiatric Hospital for 40 years. And he has um, significant, uh, he has schizophrenia and his disabilities are extremely um, um, apparent and they are constant and he is really always symptomatic. However, he did not need to live at St Trenton Psychiatric Hospital. And so the hospital, um, approached, um, did request that he uh, receive a guardian, and we did, we were approached and, and agreed to accept and were appointed by the court. And the, in this case, this is the beauty of guardianship, we were able to use the strength of our legal authority to have him removed, to have him moved out into a much more appropriate community setting where he was able to live uh, for more than 10 years after he passed away from um, in his 70s. So here's where promoting, you know, protecting from harm, the guardianship was very powerful and, and valuable and important. So just to emphasize the self-determination as de aspect of things, um, the National Guardianship Association produced a number of standards that guide guardians um, to best practice services. And I just wanted to share with you standard number nine, self-determination. Um, the, the National Guardianship Association strongly urges, um, the, the word is shall, 
um, that the guardian shall provide every opportunity for the person under guardianship to exercise his or her individual rights. Those are rights, personal and financial rights. Um, the guardian shall maximize self-reliance and independence. Um, it is our responsibility as guardian to encourage participation in all decisions and act to develop or regain capacity. So we've got to think about ways, even if the person, you know, even people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, as we know, they are not stagnant. They do grow, they do develop, they do change, they do learn. And so we, it's our job to help and promote that, um, even under guardianship. Um, here, I want to emphasize the importance um, of making and implementing a plan to fulfill the person's goals, needs, preferences, and emphasizing their strengths, skills, and abilities. And to um, uh, ensure that the person leads and or participates in planning. So here's where person-centered planning um, philosophy is so important and techniques so that we know that uh, the person is um, uh, participating in the process, leading the process of planning as much as possible. And um, we will talk a little later about plans, but the guardianship um, results in a judgment and it results in a, um, uh, a, a surrogate's letter that may or may not indicate what rights are preserved for the person, the judgment does. And so it's important to, to read and share the judgment with successor guardians. But it's also very important to write down um, in detail a person's goals, needs, preferences, because you may, as a parent, know exactly what you feel comfortable and what the person's abilities are. But a successor guardian may not, and they may actually be more um, they may uh, impose more of their own um, decision-making because they don't recognize the strengths and abilities of the individuals that they are um, appointed as successor guardian for. So I'll give you an example of um, uh, um, one person and the, the importance of um, that we are, for whom we serve as guardian and the importance of um, life planning. So uh, we were contacted by an attorney and the, the legal and estate planning was perfect. There was a trust that we were appointed as guardian. Um, and we, um, uh, so the legal aspect of us becoming guardian, this is a man who was at that time, I believe he was 21. Um, at the time he was, uh, and, and sadly he was, uh, we became his guardian. And the reason it happened very sadly was mom, um, his mother was diagnosed with leukemia and passed away six weeks after the diagnosis. The attorney had the records, uh, called us, notified us. And the challenge here um, was that we did not have a life plan for this young man. And so we didn't know a lot about him. We actually knew nothing about him. And, um, and so it was very hard to know, luckily, um, he had a very elderly grandmother in her 80s, and she was able to really communicate to us who he is, what he likes, what he's good at. And in this case, there were many rights that we needed to preserve for this young man. He was attending a college program that he loved, was very expensive, but we, because he loved it and the family had saved all their lives to, um, to have him go there, uh, we were also appointed trustee, and so we, as trustee, paid for that college program without any questions asked. He drives, and um, he so we did some extra driving assessment to make sure he was safe. But he, um, and so we bought him a car. But we would not have known that of this capacity had there been no family members, and we might not have given him the level of independence that we do um, because if we didn't know them well enough. So this is where a life plan, really clear direction to family members about everything you want and everything the person wants is so important. So um, self-determination does mean choice and control. So when we read about this, um, you know, we wanna know what do we, what do we, what do we mean by this? And, um, 
what we're what we're talking about is um, assisting a person to understand the pros and the cons of decisions that need to be made and um, and guiding them, helping them to understand um, options and um, what the opportunities are. Um, and uh, and again, our job is to help to achieve uh, the person's goals. Um, so we do have, you have to remember that even under guardianship, a person does have, they have some choice and control based on what they are willing to do or not do. And so another example is a man who is under our guardianship and he developed a nasal polyp and he did not want to have surgery to have it removed. And we knew that the surgery would not be very invasive, would not hurt him or, um, uh, in any way, um, we in any way it would only be beneficial, um, and we knew that it would help him. It would certainly help his breathing. So, but he didn't want to do it. He was frightened of surgery. He just didn't want to take any action. And so, what we did was we really used good informed consent consent techniques. We talked to him about the pros and cons of the surgery. We talked to him about pain control. How are we going to make sure he's not in pain, reduces discomfort. We talked to him about if, you know, sometimes there are people that need to go to rehab. We explain that that's what's going to happen. And so um, we were able to convince him basically that this was in his best interest and he chose and he did agree to do it. So I want to talk about surrogate decision making. So a surrogate is a substitute for a person and a guardian is appointed to be a substitute for the individual to kind of act as if they are that person. And so decision making is defined in two different ways. So a substituted judgment um, should be made in all cases whenever possible. And that judgment is what the person would do. Um, I am substituting, you know, based on what I know, and there's again where a life plan comes in or a family's um, healthcare proxy, rather um, uh, the, the, the living will instructions, that's very helpful to know what the, what the family would want. So if there's a living will, that's good guidance. Um, so this is what the person would do, and um, but a best and the difference is with a best interest decision. This is what a reasonable person would do if we don't know what the preferences are. So again, the importance of a life plan. Um, but it is not my job as guardian to make a decision uh, that I think is best that I would do for myself. Um, unless it would put the person in danger, I have to put, I have to make a decision that is what the person would do. So I think about this um, in terms of um, a couple of individuals that we support. So one man um, uh, wanted, um, he lives in a group home and, um, and he loves the idea of marriage and his mom, we do have a life plan for him and his mom made very clear two things, that she did not want the guardianship removed because she was afraid of his judgment and decision-making. Um, and she also did not want him to get married. And so my guess is that uh, apparently he really loved the idea of marriage. And we get a call from the group home one day and they say that, you know, this man really wants to get married. And so we start looking into it and working with the group home and looking into what is going on and, and you know, where he's coming from. And it turns out that his girlfriend that he wants to marry is absolutely abusive to him. The group home feels this way. We feel this way. She bosses him around. She has hit him. She's been aggressive with him. And so we worked together with the group home, got him counseling, got couples counseling, and eventually he decided he really didn't want to marry this person. Um, but of course, if it was a good match, um, we would have looked into, you know, a ceremony and a ring and, um, you know, done our best uh, to honor the mom's wishes to not let the marriage go through because we did have, she had many reasons why she didn't want that to happen. Um, 
I want to give you one other example of the best interest decision. Now, for this woman, we were not her guardian. This is a woman who we were trustee for, and she had ALS. And her brother was her power of attorney and healthcare proxy. So it was her decision. But just to give you an example of what a best interest decision would be, this woman um, believed with all her heart, she wanted no matter what to live until there was a cure for ALS. And therefore her decision and her choice was to have every possible treatment, which included a breathing tube, a feeding tube, whatever was available to her in hopes that she would live to the point of there being a cure. Sadly, she did not, but perhaps my own personal interest would have been not to suffer in that way, but this was her decision. So her brother had to make a substitute judgment decision and do for her what she wanted to do. So, um, you know, um, a best interest decision, if we didn't know, a person might, you know, the guardian might say, well, you know, you are suffering. We had one other situation where a man did have a breathing tube and a feeding tube and a doctor, a surgeon said, oh, I, I want to operate. He's got C. diff and I want to operate and give him a colostomy bag. And we thought, well, what quality of life is that? You know, a breathing tube, a feeding tube, a colostomy bag, and he... Um, you know, uh, really had no quality of life. He had been in a nursing home for years and, um, and honestly had, um, had suffered cognitive uh, uh, anoxia. And so he lost consciousness. So we really believed and the doctors believed that he didn't, he, he actually was brain dead. But this doctor was insisting that he should do a colostomy. And so we called an ethics panel and had multiple doctors um, give us input, doctors and clergy and nurses and social workers help us to understand um, that perhaps the surgeon did not have this man's best interest at heart. So again, how do we include a person in decision making? We want to disclose all the facts to that person, the facts, the benefits, the risks, and the supports. We want to assess the person's understanding. We want to ask and rephrase questions in different ways to avoid a yes or no response. Um, as we know that sometimes uh, people with developmental disabilities might just say yes or no to please an authority or maybe to disclose their lack of understanding. So sometimes we don't want to accept just a yes or no answer. We want to delve more deeply and rephrase questions. Um, and then we want to also have multiple conversations, give ample time to discuss what the choices are. So this is a, I have a couple of exercises here that I'll share with you that are called favorite things. Um, and this, this comes from a book called People Planning Ahead, A Guide to Communicating Healthcare and End of Life Wishes. Um, and um, by Lee, Leanne Creaney Kingsburg. So I love this exercise. Just ask, you know, what are the person's favorite ways to spend his or her time? Write these things down. What does the person like to spend? Who does the person like to spend time with? Who are his favorite people? What places does he like to go? Um, uh, what are, uh, and then what are, what are the person's hobbies? So we want to write down some of these things. And obviously we can ask many more questions and we want to go into real concrete depth about what they like, what they're good at, um, and what things are favorites for them. What does a day in the life look like, their favorite day? And then also critically important is, is what does the person not like? What does the family member not want the person to experience? So what are the things that the person doesn't like or what, what annoys him or her? Are there people or that the person doesn't want to be around? What makes them bored or grumpy? What's the person afraid of? And are there procedures that are necessary, but the person doesn't like? And here's a challenging situation. What if a person needs dialysis, but really doesn't like it, doesn't want it? What can you do to help the person be comfortable with it? So I'll share with you a couple of more of tools that I really enjoy, um, and then we will open it up for questions. Um, these tools are available for download on, a, um, uh, on the website lifecoursetools.com. 
These are kind of the state of the art life planning tools. And as we talked about with uh, favorite things and things a person doesn't like, the, um, these two bubbles, the top one is, um, what is a person's vision for a good life? So, you know, in bullet form, what are the things they like, they want, that are good for them now? What, what do we want to maintain, retain, obtain um, to get them, you know, to, to preserve their good life? And then what are the things we don't want? So it's important to, to also indicate, you know, places that you would never want the person to live, um, doctors you never want them to see, medications that they should never be on, and of course, preferences for things they don't like to do. Let's make sure that we know what those are, um, because especially when there is a trauma, a loss of a close family member, we may not, the person may, you know, not, not be themselves. And so we, you know, a life plan using, um, can really help to, uh, uh, to uh, identify what the person, who the person is and help, and we can help maintain their, uh, um, their good life. And this arrow is, reminds us that people are on a trajectory in life that, you know, as where people are, how people are as children are not how they are as adults, even if they have a significant intellectual or developmental disability, people do have mature, um, they mature, they have emotions that are adult emotions, even if they have a significant developmental disability. So we have to remember that people, um, will, you know, do change over time. I, you know, the example that the developer of these tools gave is that she has a brother who, when he was young, he has a developmental disability. And when he was young, he was playing with matches in a closet, as many people and many children do. And luckily, nothing happened. It was found, the fire went out and everything, you know, it was fine. He was fine. Um, but he was labeled as a fire starter and he was just a kid. And that stayed with him in his records. She had to work very hard as his guardian to have that information removed because it was just a, a little, it was a, a, a childhood action that shouldn't have stayed with him. And then this integrated support star is one that reminds us that um, the lower green, the lower right hand corner is eligibility specific. So of course we need to note down what public benefits and services the person receives. That's a very important part of our life plan, DDD services, uh, mental health services, uh, SSI, Medicaid, HUD housing, all of those things. And, and um, but, the person also, we want to be thinking and developing all the other areas of a person's life, relationships, personal strength and ass, strengths and assets, how do we promote them, build them, develop them, technology, my goodness, the iPad, the iPhone has so many tools that help me and can help people with disabilities significantly. And then community-based support, so important. If a person is, you know, loves to attend, you know, and sing in the church choir, make sure that that's in that plan and not just any church, but the church they like to sing with. And maybe you can get church choir members to, uh, to drive them and keep that as their life goal. So again, these are downloadable at lifecoursetools.com. Uh, so um, I welcome you to contact Plan New Jersey for more information. Um, we provide uh, Con uh, consultations on life planning. If you have questions, trying to think about what guardianship, you know, what form of guardianship, whether there's alternatives to guardianship, um, understanding special needs trusts better, um, dispelling some myths about those, you are welcome to call us. And there is no charge, of course, for contacting and, and discussing with us your questions. Um, so in conclusion, I'd like to just remind you that these things that we're talking are all related to person-centered planning principles. Um, what we're looking to do with a, for a person who is under guardianship is to help them to maintain their authority to direct their own services. Um, we want to help them to maintain valued roles. We want to help them to lead and participate uh, in their own planning um, experiences, and we want to promote options and choices and their participation in them. And do remember that um, 
writing all of this down, um, it's much more detailed than an in individualized support plan. M write narratives about who the person is and pass these things on to your successor guardians. Use a life plan as a communication tool to inform successor guardians about how you would like them treated and, and supported. And uh, so I will stop sharing and Jared, we will move on to questions if there are any. And you can also unmute yourself if you'd like to do a verbal question. All right, so first, thank you very much, Ellen. That was a very informative presentation. So, you know, as she had said, if you have any questions, um, you're welcome to submit them in the chat box or that's probably the easier route just so not everyone unmutes themselves at once and asks questions. Um, but, you know, if you have any questions, Ellen is more than happy to address them. One of the things that uh, a, a, a parent had uh, talked to me about was this, um, this balancing act between autonomy and prevention from harm. And um, this is where it's very important if you are moving for guardianship and you're, you're approaching, you can do it pro se, you can do it without a guardian. Um, there are forms available, I mean, sorry, without an attorney, there are, a, there are forms available online, um, but you will have to pay for the court appointed attorney that represents your child. But do discuss with your attorney, if you're using an attorney, what rights you want the person to retain. You know, if you feel strongly that there are, you want to um, maintain a person, you want the person to have full involvement in where they're going to live or what educational opportunities or um, they, they might have, or um, even if, if you're comfortable with them driving or whatever it might be, discuss that with your attorney so that they can encourage, uh, they can even ensure that those things are written in the guardianship judgment. So there is legal um, authority for the person to retain certain rights. Ellen, I have a question for you. Do you ever serve as a co-guardian with a parent or family member? And if you do serve as a co-guardian with them, how do you reconcile if there are, if, if the other, if the co-guardian wants one thing and you guys think the other is in the best interest, how do you reconcile that? Well, the answer, the, the question is appropriate, and, and the answer is that, the re, that we do not serve as co-guardian just for that reason. So we do not want to be in a position, we, families can and should be the guardian whenever possible. So one of the roles that Plan New Jersey takes, um, and which families find very helpful, I think, is that we will support a sibling to be guardian. We will help them to understand what questions they might be dealing with, even to understand the annual report for guardian, but we won't serve as co-guardian for this reason. We don't want to be in conflict with the family. Um, we have in the past done it without problems, but we were sort of anticipating that this could be an issue and we just don't want to be there. But the one time that we did do this, the father was very elderly and ill, and he just didn't want to take a risk um, of having us, um, you know, of, of there being any gap. And so um, uh, if he passed away suddenly. So we served, but the attorney was able to um, put in the judgment that the role, the, the primary responsibility was the father's. So he actually was able to put in the judgment and, and um, I'm not an attorney, so I can't say how easy that is for a judge to agree to that or not, but that is a way to manage that and handle that. In some cases, you know, even if it's family members, sometimes a, dark, a, you know, a hospital will ask that um, both co-guardians be present. And so that's something to consider. And I don't know what you think, Jared, about that idea, even if there's co-guardians to kind of describe which guardian should take the lead. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, from our experience, you know, without other language in the judgment itself, the guardians are to act jointly and together, you know, on decisions, you know, but the judgments, we create the judgments, which we provide to the court it's as a proposed form of judgment for the judge to sign. And oftentimes the judge will, you know, revise 
judgments that we submit, um, we can always add additional language in. So as long as the judge signs it and we can, you know, provide a basis for, you know, the reasons why, um, you know, we're putting this, you know, unusual or unique language in there, oftentimes it's not a problem. Right. I have a question um, for you, Ellen. Is your organization, being Plan New Jersey, currently offering in-person consultations? And I have a second question. If you do, what is the cost? So there is no cost for consultations at all ever, number one. And number two, at this point, we're using only virtual um, uh, meetings. Um, we're preferring to, because of the, the COVID risk, we are preferring to um, uh, meet people virtually or by telephone at this point. We have restarted visiting in person our, the clients that we serve, the, the, our guardian clients, at a social distance with masks, um, but uh, we, if at all possible for new for consultations, we prefer to um, meet you, reduce the risk for for everyone, and uh, meet you for virtually. Was there a second question, or did I answer both there, Jared? You answered both of them. Okay. Does any anybody else have any thoughts or any questions specifically for Plan New Jersey or Ellen? You know, as far as perhaps an entity or an, or an organization, organization, excuse me, serving as a guardian? Let me just mention that um, if, you, if your son or daughter is under guardianship and, um, and you have not appointed a successor guardian, uh, and your attorney will will do that for you in a will. You really need to do it in in the will. Not you. You can you do express who you want as guardian and and name multiple successors in a life plan. But the legal method of doing that, you're not um, the the legal um, assurance that your um, your preferences um, need to go in a will. It is up to a judge actually to appoint the successor. So even when families ask Plan New Jersey to serve a successor, we still have to be appointed um, by the court to serve as successor. Um, in rare instances, a judge will appoint us as successor prior to the family passing away. If we can, uh, if, if the attorney can demonstrate that the family is you know, very ill um, or at risk. Um, but um, if you need a guardian and have, um, if there is nobody else to serve, then you may be familiar with the State Guardian, Bureau of Guardianship Services. Um, most folks with developmental disabilities, if you are under services of the Division of Developmental Disabilities, um, you, the BGS, Bureau of Guardianship Services, could serve and may be appointed if there is nobody else to serve. But we do want to consider that um, they are a state organization with limited state funding. And so the caseloads are very, very large. And so um, it's hard for the guardian to make, to be very personal and promote the kind of self-determination that we might prefer for our loved ones. So, you know, one of the ways to thinking about it is if a family, you know, family member is available but hesitant because they're very busy because they have their own fit kids, they have, may have kids with disabilities themselves, using an, an organization um, as an advocate can really help the family member be comfortable be serving as successor. If they know that whatever comes their way, they have an organization to call to say, well, what do I do about this? What does this mean? You know, families very often, especially in the DD community, are very knowledgeable about DDD and the fee-for-service changes and the support coordination and support brokerage. Um, siblings may not know about all these things, and it may be very confusing and, and, and difficult for them to make decisions about this, even medical decisions. They may not know how they can go about really ensuring that they get the information that they're entitled to. So an advocate can be very helpful. And if a family member, if the sibling, for example, knows that there is an agency that can help them, support them, guide them to make these decisions, they may be much more willing, much more comfortable to serve in that capacity. So I do encourage people to, uh, 
to consider having an organization to support and, and see whether that makes a family member more comfortable. Okay. Um, Ellen, can a person be married and also have a guardian? Yes, they can. Yes. Uh, we were guardian um, for an individual, to, for, for two people um, who were married and um, they, um, we were guardian of the, um, of the property for one person um, only, just managing her finances. Um, and uh, her brother was guardian of the person for her. And we were guardian of the person and property of her husband because there was no family that wanted to serve. So it was a little complicated. Um, we definitely had to work. We, we worked very closely with the, the wife's guardian of the person. Um, and, you know, he gave him all the information he needed about her property interests. And uh, so, yes, can be done. Is there a fee for Plan New Jersey being a guardian? So there is a fee. However, it doesn't start until we become a guardian. Um, we charge an hourly rate, $115 an hour. So um, again, and generally people plan for this in their, with a, a special needs trust. So they think about leaving a, um, uh, an inheritance for the individual as much as they can. Some people fund it with life insurance. Um, and they leave it in a special needs trust so it's protected and the public benefits, they maintain their Medicaid and, and SSI and HUD housing, very critical uh, to DDD services, as you know. Um, so the average fee, again, there is, there, there is no fee for s until we start the services, both tr trustee or guardianship. So this could be 20 years from now um, that we start to charge. And the fee depends on the level of support the person has in their community. So there are some people that the fee is three thirty-five, three thousand, or thirty-five hundred dollars a year. There are some people the fee is five thousand dollars a year. Just depends on where they live. We do have some people who live independently on their own in the community. We are ordering food for them when they're no longer able to shop. Um, we're very intensively involved in their day-to-day -day medical and recreation and housing and all these decisions. For other people, they're living in a group home or supervised apartment. They have excellent support and then the fees are low. Again, it's an hourly rate. And, you know, if we serve 10 minutes, we charge for 10 minutes. So. And, and if I may just add on to that, there's a, all guardians, whether it's Plan New Jersey or if it's an individual family guardian, are entitled to take a commission or be compensated for their efforts, right? So all guardians do have that ability. Uh, we have another question here for, uh, for Ellen. How can Plan New Jersey support a family member being guardian without being a co-guardian? Well, we can support them by helping them to make decisions, to, th to make their decisions. So they can call us or email us or forward a document and say, I got this letter from DDD. I don't know what it means or I don't know how to respond to it or I disagree. And we can um, assist them in our knowledge from an advocacy standpoint. Um, I don't like what the, ser the service coordinator is doing, the support coordinator rather, you know, the DDD support coordinator. We can help either get that person to be more effective by attending meetings, or we can help the family to change to a different support coordinator agency or just person. Um, so we can be very helpful. We even help people to understand the annual guardian reports that are required by the courts. Um, we can draft letters for people. If they don't know what to say, we can say, all right, here's a suggested draft. What, what do you think about this? And, um, you know, so there's lots of ways that we can assist the, uh, the sibling or the guardian to, um, to serve in that role, understand what they need to do, what their responsibilities are, um, you know, kind of, we, we're not lawyers, but we have 32 years of experience and um, a great depth of knowledge. Our board are all volunteers, very broad level of experience, as well as more than 50% family members of people with disabilities. So we've got three attorneys on the board, two nurses, two CPAs, uh, an ex-banker, um, a couple of social workers, 
Um, so we have people, because being guardian is making decisions for the whole person. So we've got medical, financial, legal, all sorts of issues that we are confronted with. So that's, so we can kind of be the support to the, the individual, so uh, to the family. Whereas the individual may have lots of supports and those supports may be very effective and that's terrific, that's perfect. Our job is to help keep it that way. So I think this next question is a testament to your um, excellent presentation, but I have a question whether Ellen, you specifically, do you set up the initial sessions or does a staff member at Plain New Jersey do it? Um, initial sessions meeting with families. I personally am very happy to meet with any family that would like to meet with me. Um, Jason Miller is on this call. He's our director of social services. He is a uh, extremely knowledgeable, extremely skilled, been with us for, I think it's close to 15 years. Um, how, and so he meets with many families, but I am very happy to meet with any family. And, and I do we meet with many, especially if we're going to be successor guardian. I actually prefer to know who the families are and what their preference is. And I, I'm really very closely involved. It's actually my name that is on the guardianship um, judgment. Um, it's, it's me or my successors. Um, the organization is technically the, the guardian, um, but, we, but, but judges tend to want to have a name. So it is the executive director, but we do have staff members uh, for full-time and for part-time who visit with the individuals. So I visit if somebody is very ill or if there's a serious situation, but otherwise our staff members are intimately, they know the individuals we serve well and our, our individuals know us well. Um, they call us all the time if, they're, if they use the phone. Um, I will tell you one advantage of COVID, um, it, not much is good about it, but um, we of course started using um, video conferencing sent, if people didn't have an iPad, uh, we sent them iPads. And there are a few people that we've noticed actually communicate more easily on the iPad. So we do in-person visits face-to-face. -face. That's, we need to lay eyes on the individual. However, we've noticed that sometimes the visual virtual method is, is really better in terms of communication for, for one or two of our individuals. So we plan to continue to do both. Great. Uh, question for you. For mental health only, is there a mental health only limited type of guardianship this individual could get for their 19-year-old who refused treatment? treatment? Um, I think, for instance, what they're asking is, you know, would they be able to a place for necessary services when needed? And I think that's the ultimate goal here, you know, as far as obtaining guardianship. <clears throat> I have heard, I am aware that this is possible. I will say that it can be difficult in my experience, or, or actually this might be better for Jared to answer and I'll ask him to do so. Um, but I, I am aware of one or two situations where just that guardianship for that purpose, to allow, to um, permit the family member to admit the person to a hospital when they um, when they're ill and um, symptomatic. Um, but Jared, do you want to add to that? Yeah, sure. And, and just to piggyback off of that, you know, if you, if anyone here that's, you know, a participant is in a similar situation where perhaps their child refuses treatment, refuses to be seen by the doctors, and if you tune into our session a little bit later on, we'll talk about the requirements of guardian, one of which is at least a doctor certification. So, you know, what happens if the person refuses to go, you, know, you can't obtain that examination, you can't get the, um, the certification. Don't let that stop you from pursuing guardianship. You can always file with the court and you can demonstrate to the judge, you know, the circumstances surrounding why you were unable to do that and what you're ultimately looking to obtain. You know, so really what it sounds like is, you know, you'd be looking for a limited guardianship with respect to maybe an even more limited uh, medical guardianship relating solely to the mental health aspect. And I have one last question here. Um, I think that I've gotten through all the other ones. Um, question is, what do annual reports of guardians entail? Does the surrogate office send it out for a response? It is available. It's a PDF. You can look at them now online. Um, the surrogate does give you um, the, when you, when you are um, appointed as guardian, the surrogate, you have to go through a training. 
Um, there's a booklet that they give you about your responsibilities. Um, you generally have to submit um, a, uh, an, um, an inventory um, of assets if you're guardian of the property. And then at the, basically at the end of the year, it looks complicated, the form, but it's really not. Once you fill it out once, um, it's, you know, you're kind of re, um, it, it isn't very complicated. So there's a cover letter that is called the report, a cover letter to the report of well-being. So if you are a guardian of the person, um, they will ask, have, has the person seen the doctor? If so, when? You'll have to attach certifications from the doctor, you know, reports that the person has seen um, critical doctors and have you paid the person's taxes and do the, does the person still need a guardian? That's a question you have to answer. What have there been, what have their activities been? What recreational activities, you know, are there any concerns that you have? So you're kind of reporting and it's very brief. They're short, brief answers. Um, very easy to to fill out the report of well-being. And then the, um, the financial aspect, uh, most people will receive what's called an easy um, accounting format. And it's, it really is very basic. It's how much money have you collected for the person? How much money have you distributed for the person? For what purpose have you invested for them? Um, trusts are not included in this, so it's separate from the uh, um, any trust accounting that you might do, um, and um, but it's it's not very complicated. And again, it's a form. But it's it, very it's important. More... Yeah, I just wanted to oh, say. I'm sorry, not to interrupt. That's okay. It's very important for families to submit these. Um, there, some counties look at these more closely than others. But years, several years ago, a volunteer review commission was set up. And so most of these are being reviewed. Some counties are gonna be more, um, some counties call us and say, well, you said this, I'd like more information. Um, other counties, I know in one case, we, regard, we are guardian of the property for somebody and somebody else is guardian of the person and the guardian of the person didn't submit the forms and they were sent several reminders um, and the court threatened to remove that uh, guardianship until they got it done and we helped them to get it done to make sure because you know they cared they were a relative they wanted to serve but they just didn't get that done so it can be a very serious matter go ahead Jerry. And, and and as the guardian you know you, you certainly don't want to end up in court having to explain to a judge you know why you aren't completing your end of the bargain as far as submitting your annual report so it's good practice to complete get it done especially if you plan on moving or transferring out of the state and you have to close out the guardianship, they're going to want to have that on file. And just one other quick question for you about the reports, Ellen. Um, I have a question here. How do you, uh, how do you, what date to fill out the yearly report on? Um, they, the court expects it, I believe it's 10 days after the date of the, no later than 10 days after the date of the original appointment for guardianship. So you really want to have that in your calendar, prepare, start, prepare it a month in advance. Um, you have to attach bank statements with it, as well as, as I mentioned, the, the medical reports. Um, but, but definitely the date of the appointment is your target date. So I believe that's all the questions we've received right now. So one, one last question. How much is a consult with you? I believe you said the consults are free, if I heard correctly. So there are no consults. So we do not if, if you find yourself in a position of needing a guardian or a successor guardian, I highly encourage you to reach out to Ellen and play New Jersey, and I'm sure they'll be able to assist you. Yeah, no, there is no charge. And really, you're not really charging, paying anything until, except if you want us to write a, light, a formal life plan for you. That's a very comprehensive document. Um, but in general, you're really not paying anything until we are appointed guardian or until we start to serve as trustee when a person has died and a trust is funded, um, or if we are doing routine regular monitoring visits. At that point, we charge that hourly rate of $115 an hour. Um, but you know that can be quarterly, that can be annually, um, that can be you know not at all. For some people, they write a life plan with us and then we don't hear from them for 20 years. We do hope that once you write the life plan, 
you do update it periodically, many things change for individuals. Um, and we want to keep that as updated as possible. And of course, there is no charge to revise that life plan. Some families do it four times a year, and that's fine. Uh, we want to keep it fresh and relevant. Um, so uh, thank you so much for your attention. And um, we would be happy to speak with you um, if you'll just give our main office a call or you can contact us through our website. Main office number is 908-575-8300. And just say whether your, your interest is guardianship or this monitoring and advocacy program or trust administration, just so we can route you to your most important uh, questions first, and then you'll speak with, you, but you'll speak with all the relevant staff that you need to speak with. Thank you again. All right, thank, thank you again, Ellen. Um, it was a wonderful presentation, and I hope everyone learned um, some information from this. And again, just to reiterate, you know, if you haven't already signed up, sign up for the keynote speaker tonight. Uh, Justice Hohn should have a great presentation. So with that, uh, we hope to see you again at a future our seminar today and tomorrow. And with that, everyone continue to stay safe and be well. Thanks again, Ellen. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching this encore presentation from the Fall 2020 Hinkle, Pryor & Fisher Parent Empowerment Conference. With 24 other presentations to view, there is plenty of additional information to help you become empowered. As a reminder, the information contained in this video is not a substitute for individual legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. Copyright 2020, Hinkle, Pryor & Fisher, PC, Attorneys at Law. All rights reserved.